Warning, the following podcast, which contains strong language and mature content, is unsuitable for children or for the faint of heart. The subject matter discussed will be frightening and graphic in nature. Listener discretion is advised. When you want to hear about the paranormal, you get the spooked girls. True crime that makes you hypothermal with the three spooked girls. Stabby snippets will give you dreams. Tara and Jessica will make you. Along with the spooked girls Bring on the slaughter We on that haunted ground The three spooked girls Hey spooksters and welcome back to another episode here on Three Spooked Girls. My name is Tara and as always I'm here with my ghoul friend Jessica. Hello! Hello. And today we're going to be talking about some female serial killers in honor of women. What is it? Women's History Month? International Women's Month. Oh, International Women's Month. You know, we love a good theme. Technically, March 8th, which is tomorrow, and they're listening. Uh huh. Yes. Um, is International Women's Day. Oh, and then we as women were like, a day? No, we get a month. Yes. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, then this is like perfect timing. So we're just going to go ahead and dive in. The first one, I can't remember if we've talked about her on here. I don't think we have. Is Leonardo Cianciulli. It's the soap maker lady. Oh. So she went through like a lot of stuff in her life. She had multiple miscarriages. Her mom died and it just put her probably like on a life journey to be like, what am I going to do with my life type of shit? Mm -hmm. So she goes to a fortune teller. I love this so far. Not so much now because she was told that she would outlive her children. Oh, I don't like that. No. So she became extremely paranoid and just really obsessed with all of this. They say her madness sent her into her series of murders she committed. She committed her crimes between 1939 and 1940. What she did was she would lure her victims with the promise of help only to kill them and use their remains to make soaps and cakes. Her belief was that these sacrifices would protect her children. Cakes? Like as in num nums? Like Sweeney Todd. Yeah. It's the two that's throwing me. It's the fact that she made soap and cake. Right? That's like two very opposite things. (laughs) Right? I'm like, I don't, like, pick one. She was known as like the soap maker, like in their area. So, yeah. Well, got that high quality tallow in it. Ew, ew. (laughs) You guys couldn't see the face (laughs) I made when I said it. I was like, no, no, I was kidding, guys. Oh, God, guys, this is where we're at today. It's fine. (laughs) Another one I'm probably going to mispronounce is Irma Grease, the hyena of Auschwitz. Oh. I hadn't heard of her either. Hyena. Born in 1923, she grew up in a troubled household. Her early life, however, offers little explanation for the path she would take. As a young woman, she voluntarily joined the ranks of the SS and was assigned to several concentration camps, including Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. Her reign of terror in these camps were marked by extreme brutality. She took perverse pleasure in torturing and killing prisoners, often selecting them for the gas chambers. Her sadistic acts earned her the fear and loathing of inmates and a place in history as one of the most brutal female Nazi guards. The trial and subsequent execution of her post-World War II raised critical questions about the role of women in the Nazi regime and the capacity for cruelty that lies within. Her story is a grim reminder of the depths of inhumanity possible under the guise of ideology and power. That's a lot. Yeah, that's one I think we should know about for sure. For sure. All right, I have to just preface. I'm probably going to pronounce this stuff wrong. And don't judge me, guys, because I am sorry. I am the most whitewashed person ever. So I'm very, very <laughs> Is sorry. Is it a Hispanic name? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Like, I'm literally half Mexican and Spanish. So like, yeah, sorry. But you guys know my mom's an asshole. So here we are. So we have Juana Braza. 
the Mata Vietas, which means old lady killer. I kind of actually want to like do a deep dive on this one. Her string of murders in Mexico City shook the nation and shattered stereotypes about female serial killers. Her background had tons of hardships. So she went through a childhood of abuse and neglect, which people believe may have been a contributing factor to what she does later on. However, it's her career as a professional wrestler that adds an unusual twist to her story, masking the sinister side of her personality. Her victims were elderly women, and they were strangled or bludgeoned to death in their homes. Oh my god. Yeah, it says, Barraza exploited societal trust, presenting herself as a government official to gain entry. Her motives remain a complex tangle of psychological trauma and deep-seated anger. The case of Juana Barraza not only exposes the brutality she was capable of, but also highlights the vulnerabilities and often overlooked risks faced by the elderly. That's wild. I was just talking to a coworker to today about like how elderly people like they basically like are so susceptible to like cons and fraud Mm -hmm. and this is even like more because people are so trusting yeah and especially if someone comes and is like hi i'm the government right we are trained to be like okay government let me comply with you Mm -hmm. that's crazy i want to look at her case some more oh because i want to watch this So the next one on this list is Griselda Blanco, the Black Widow of Cocaine. Of Cocaine? Yeah. You haven't seen stuff about this? No. Oh, was this? Oh, no, never mind. I take back I, I take back my <laughs> sentence. Yes. For some reason, I didn't process that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, Griselda Blanco, also known as the Black Widow, has been named one of the most ruthless women in the drug trade. Her rise and fall in the cocaine business are tales of brutality, cunning, and unprecedented power. Born in Colombia, Blanco's life was steeped in violence from an early age. Her ascent into the male dominated world of drug trafficking was marked by a brutal efficiency and a willingness to eliminate anyone who stood in her way. Her operations in the U.S. during the 1970s and 80s were instrumental in turning Miami into a drug war zone. Murders, kidnappings, and drug trafficking were the tools of her trade, earning her a fearsome reputation. The life and crimes of Griselda Blanco underscore the intersections of gender, power, and crime. Her story is a testament to the extremes of human ambition and the destructive paths it can lead to. I don't condone the murder and the crime but it's like when a woman is like a crime boss you're kind of like okay girl boss i see you do just legal things but that's pretty badass but like yeah (laughs) it's cool that you broke into a male dominated industry next time do it legally yeah okay our next one her name is ma baker the matriarch of mayhem Okay, like, stop giving them such great names. Like, (laughs) I want to be like, oh, this is real cool. But I'm like, oh, y'all are fucking terrible people. Yeah. But I like the matriarchy of mayhem. That's a pretty badass name. Pretty much, yeah. Stop doing bad things. For real. Okay, so Kate, aka Ma Baker, she is described as the matriarch of a criminal family, occupies a unique place in the space of American crime. Her life and involvement with the Barker Carpus gang have been the subject of debate and speculation. The image of Ma Baker as the mastermind behind her son's criminal endeavors has been contested, with some arguing that she was more of a passive participant. However, her association with the gang's notorious bank robberies, kidnappings, and murders during the public enemy era remains undisputed. Whether a criminal mastermind or an unwilling accomplice, Ma Baker represents a complex figure in the narrative of female criminality, challenging stereotypes, and raising questions about family dynamics and criminal behavior. I just want to point out that her birth name was Arizona. I'm like, wow, you have gone by so many names and we're gonna do her one of these days because like, dang, Ma Baker. See, I'm giving everybody all the rabbit holes. <laughs> I, know, I like was like, I want to know this woman. And then I looked her up. She is such the quintessential like, um, like 20s mob boss. Oh, 100%. I love it. I was like, mm-hmm, okay, 1932. I see you. Right. Okay. Have we talked about Belle Gunnis? The name sounds familiar. The Lady Bluebeard. 
Oh, then no, I don't think we have. I don't think we have, or she's probably maybe been on the list, but we're going to go ahead and talk about her again. So Belle was born in Norway, and she immigrated to the U.S. where she would embark on a murderous spree. Her victims were often suitors or husbands, and she lured them by promise of love or financial gain, only to meet a gruesome fate. The discovery of numerous bodies at her farm in Indiana unveiled the extent of her crimes. Belle's ability to evade suspicion for years underscores the dangerous intersection of gender expectations and criminal cunning. The story of Belle Gunnis delves into the darkest aspects of the human psyche, revealing how trust and affection can be twisted into tools of manipulation and murder. She has over 14 kills. Yeah. These women... I know. Good God. I know. Oh my God, this is like super OG topic. Holy shit. It's debated, but she's on here. Elizabeth Bathory, the blood countess. Oh my God. Yeah, that's so old. Oh my God. If you guys want us to redo that one, let us know. I don't even think it's on Patreon anymore. I don't even know. I don't even know. But if you guys want us to cover her, let us know like now-ish so we can get it in for spooky season. Oh my God. Yeah. Because I, yeah, I honest (laughs) to God think that like that was when we were doing like shit on Skype. We do not need to talk about this right now. No, you know, it's funny. (laughs) Sorry for the interruption. You know, it's funny. I was actually talking about this with my therapist today because she was like interested, like, you know, how we've developed over the years. And I was like, yeah, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We got on Skype and just hoped for the best. It wasn't until I got like an actual MacBook that we started recording like legit (laughs) recording. And then, oh my God, guys, we used to still Skype each other. But Skype is so like old. Skype is so old when you use it it like just dies because it can't support people on it and yeah. we'd have to like pause our recording and get back on the Skype and now it's like we use like our MacBooks <laughs> our, literally we just FaceTime each other computers yeah FaceTime and then record obviously yeah we don't record through FaceTime I want people to oh god <laughs> like no. That. No, no 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 we each record in our own computers <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're gonna move on. But you guys, if you want an episode on her, let us know. I think we should just do it. Okay, we're gonna just do that. There you go. Oh, this next one. So if you guys are murder mystery and makeup fans, you will know this one. It's Julia Tafana, the Aqua Tafana lady. Oh. It says, though not a direct killer herself, Julia Tafana provided poison that killed hundreds of men in 17th century Italy. She was born in Palmero in 1620 when she was young, her mother was executed for killing her father with poison. Like mother, like daughter, apparently. I mean, her mom got caught. Right. And growing up, she spent a lot of time in apothecaries. And it was said that this is where she perfected her own brand of poison, Aqua Tafana, which was a slow acting poison with no color or taste with effects that could easily be mistaken for other illnesses. Oh my God. Sociopath. Well, we're going to have kind of like a Dexter situation. Oh. She sold the poison to women who were trapped in abusive marriages as a way of allowing them to kill their husbands. Okay. I don't condone this, but okay. (laughs) Her business boomed and she eventually relocated to Rome and hired her daughter and three assistants to help her. And she was eventually reported by a widow. So some bitch went and fucking told on her. (gasps) Wait, 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 wait. So somebody used her services and then told on her. Mm. Probably felt guilty. I don't approve of the murders, but I also don't approve of the snitching when you have used said service. However, so many people believed that her actions were charitable that she was briefly granted sanctuary in a church before being forcibly removed by the police. Tofana, her daughter, and three assistants were all executed in 1659. Oh my god. Right? They took down the whole fucking MLM. All of them. They took the whole enterprise. Gone. The first one. (laughs) (laughs) It's the first MLM. It ended badly. Okay. Our next one is Mary Ann Cotton. She is thought to be Britain's first female serial killer. She is suspected of having murdered around 21 people using arsenic as a way of claiming life insurance payments. So over the course of her life, she moved around England and 
lost 21 people close to her, including three husbands, a lover, a friend, her mother, and 11 children, all of who died suddenly of stomach fevers. Cotton became the focus of rumor. She was eventually arrested after a suspicious doctor tested the remains of one of her victims and discovered arsenic. She was tried in 1873 and protested her innocence. In spite of the likely scale of her crimes, she was only convicted of one killing, her stepson, Charles Edward Cotton. She was hanged in 18. 1873. I feel like there was this show that was like a crime show of like all these old timey ones in England. And I feel like her story was on there. Because if not, like, why wouldn't it be? Right. It was on Netflix years ago. I have not watched it since. Like how long ago this was was like 2013 when I was watching this show. Dang. All right. Well, that is going to go ahead and wrap us up for today. We hope you guys enjoyed. I hope I prompted some rabbit hole searches for you guys because I definitely think I did for Jess and I. I'm not currently looking at people on the phone. <laughs> not looking at people. It's fine. <laughs> but anyways, with that, we'll go ahead and sign off and we will see you back here on Monday. Bye, guys. Toodles. Toodles.